coming soon to VHS. The Friday the 13th movies are one of the most well-known 80s movie series of all time, at least in the horror movie fandom. And even if you aren't a huge scary movie fan, you almost certainly know of Jason Voorhees or at least recognize his iconic bloody hockey mask. The original trilogy was so popular that they ended up resurrecting Jason for an even better gruesome ending. And I use the word ending very loosely because, well, we got eight more. And honestly, I'm kind of happy that it did do so well because now I get to cover this gem of an 80s film. The outdated but fun special effects, the cheesy writing, and the over-the-top plot of the trilogy was great and all, but I really feel like it gets so much better in the final chapter, the fourth film in this extensive series. In case you haven't seen the original trilogy or just forgot all that happened in these slashers, the final chapter actually does a really good job recapping everything that's happened in the first two and a half minutes, complete with a few of the most unique deaths from the previous films, so you can jump in without having to go back and rewatch if you don't feel like it. This was something that director Joseph Zito was against having in the final cut, and I could see it being a little frustrating for those of us that went and binged all four movies back to back, but I feel like it's really helpful for newcomers wanting to join in the frenzy. Set immediately after the third film, the movie opens with our infamous hockey masked killer returning to life and making his way back to Crystal Lake after being allegedly defeated by our survivor in the third film. We meet our newest group of ill-fated rowdy teens arriving at a vacation home across the lake from Camp Crystal Lake and their neighbors the Jarvis family and their amazing dog Gordon, who makes it to the end for all you dog lovers out there. While the group of teens do take up most of the screen time, the story element lies more so with the Jarvis siblings Tommy and Trish. Sorry victims, you're just here to satisfy the bloodthirsty viewers, and boy does Jason live up to those expectations. While the victims met some pretty terrible fates, it seemed like there were several mishaps that took place on set for a few of the actors themselves, definitely living up to the unlucky vibe of anything Friday the 13th. Things eventually got so bad that Ted White, the stuntman who played Jason, demanded he be uncredited as Jason Voorhees. Tensions between him and Zito were already bad enough as it was, but it was the death scene of Judy Aronson's character Samantha that was eventually what tipped things over the edge. Apparently Judy wasn't allowed out of the lake between shots so she could warm up. This film was shot in December, and Judy ended up with hypothermia because she was forced to spend literal hours completely naked in the freezing water. It was only when Ted threatened to quit that Zito ended up letting her come out of the lake. Not only did Ted advocate for Judy's health, but also tried to get a crash pad for Doug's death scene, played by Peter Barton, who didn't initially want to be in the film to begin with. The scene required Peter's head to get forcefully slammed against a shower wall, but no pad was ever given. Even with all the mishaps, the actors did a really good job in their respective roles, and the writing for these characters was a step up from the previous trilogy. My favorites being Jimmy, Trish, and Tommy. Jimmy, played by Crispin Glover, who's most known for his work in the Back to the Future series, was so organically awkward, it was amazing. The scene where he tries to dance with Terry was probably one of my favorite parts of his performance. Apparently, the song he danced to during filming was ACDC's Back in Black, and was dubbed over by Love as a Lie by Lion in the final cut for monetary reasons. While the dancing itself is chaos regardless of the song, it makes it even better that with the dub over, the dancing is even more offbeat than before. Trish Jarvis, played by Kimberly Beck, as the survivor of this film, really made me excited. In an era where the female characters in horror films ran away at best, or stood still and screamed without defending themselves from the killers at worst, it was super refreshing to see Trish fight back more so than the previous survivors in the series. Yes, she ran away screaming, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, but when it came down to it, she did her best to fight to get away or protect her brother. I also included Tommy because of how well Corey Feldman, also known for his roles in The Goonies and The Lost Boys, was able to act out his scenes despite being blind to a lot of what was going on. And by that I mean the fact that the crew actively used strategic editing with shots that would prevent him from seeing a lot of the bad stuff, if you will. He was 12 at the time, so scenes like the ones where Tommy and Trish come up on the skinny dipping partiers was shot so he never saw any of the topless teens. The scene at the end where Tommy ends up hacking apart Jason? Sandbags. Though Corey admits that he had such a dislike for director Zito, he pretended that they were him instead. Ouch. All in all, we've been privy to some pretty lackluster child acting, especially in horror films, so it was great to see him on par with the rest of the cast. There were some things with a few of the characters, however, that I had a little bit of a hard time with that I wish had been added or changed. For example, I was really disappointed with Erich Anderson's character Rob. The way he was introduced and portrayed for the majority of the screen time was one of someone who could definitely take on, or at least hold their own, against Jason. He's the strong, very capable guy who's hunting down Jason to avenge his sister Sandra, one of the victims killed two days prior in the second movie actually, but his death really, really fell flat. When Jason finally gets a hold of him, he just doesn't really fight back. 
And I hate to admit it, but when I watched the scene the first time, I just ended up laughing. Instead of fighting, he ends up yelling to Trish, He's killing me! And it is such a jarring disconnect from the character that it pulled me out of the movie. I did come to find out after the fact that the scene was actually based on a real-life murder that Zito had been inspired by, where the victim actually repeatedly screamed, Please stop hurting me, please stop killing me. And had I known this the first time around, the scene wouldn't have seemed so silly to me. Zito himself even said he regretted the choice to have Rob scream that, as he felt it made the scene less impactful. I also wish that we had concrete answers as to what had happened to Trish and Tommy's mother, Tracy. It is very much implied that she spots Jason before the scene cuts away from her. It just kind of felt like an awkward choice to leave out this one death, or proof of the death, when you've seen literally everyone else's in the series. Her death was explained in a scene that didn't make it to the final cut, and after reading about it, it made even less sense as to why it didn't make it in. The scene was supposed to be another Survivor's dream ending sequence. A scene that was included in all of the prior films, and a pretty important one to the conclusion of each movie. And in this one, it would have shown Trish finding her mother's body in the bathtub upstairs before she wakes up in a hospital. Very much like the first movie. This final movie had so many parallels to pay homage to the first film that the scene would have been a perfect inclusion to have. It just leaves me wondering why they ultimately decided against it. Still, the movie had a lot going for it. Unlike the last three, this one had more of a story to go along with it, and you get to know a little bit more about the characters rather than just having the cast show up to be killed. We learn a little bit about Trish and Tommy's separated parents, Tommy's love for special effects and repair skills, Jimmy's recent breakup and Ted's abysmal dating advice, Samantha and Sarah's respective relationship troubles, and so much more. It was nice to care about the characters a little bit instead of just seeing them as horny kids being led to the slaughter, which is fine for the first couple of films, but it was enough to change up this script while keeping it in line with what its audience expected going into it. The production budget also seems to be a lot bigger than the previous two. I mean, they even went so far as to have a whole scene where Tommy takes Rob up to see all of the cool special effects, masks, and props he's made. And sure, it sets up for the end sequence and how Tommy defeats Jason, but it really felt like they went above and beyond with that scene. Just like Tommy's name, this scene paid homage to the work of Tom Savini, the original makeup and horror effects artist of the original Friday the 13th film, who returned for the fourth and final movie. Considering CGI in movies was still super sparse compared to today, the giant use of these practical effects in the scene would have been huge for this movie. I think the best part for me though were the fight and action sequences. As briefly mentioned earlier, I really enjoy that our survivors weren't making completely stupid decisions 100% of the time, or they just didn't have time to process or react to what was happening. In the first film, for example, there was more face-to-face -face interaction with a few of the victims, so they had time to be scared and recognize that they were in danger or something was off. And the bodies were just kind of hidden or placed off to the side. And granted, that was the work of his mother, but Jason in this one used almost everyone as a trap to take out the others. The victims were strategically left in places where he knew people would find them, they'd start screaming from the shock of unsuspectingly finding a body, and then he'd be able to pinpoint exactly where they were. But he also made sure that the ones who did scream an alarm were distant enough from the rest so it wouldn't alert the remainder of the group. It was only when everyone in the house of partiers were taken out that he got more bold with Trish and Tommy, but at that point it's just like the very final showdown, so it's pretty gory cool. Everything just happened so quickly and was set up so flawlessly to commit the perfect slaughter that it didn't leave time for anyone to make a ton of bad decisions that made you shake your head in exasperation. Of course, there were still some pretty dumb decisions. It kind of confused me when Trish and Rob race back home to check on Tommy when it's revealed to Trish that Jason's back hunting around the lake, only for them to once again leave him alone and unprotected to go check on the neighbors next door. Like, guys, come on. At least leave Gordon with him for some protection. If a whole slew have been taken out in groups, what makes you think a single child will fare much better? Trish also had a few moments of the obligatory standing and screaming moments instead of escaping or doing anything really, but it was still a far cry better from Alice's attempts at survival in the first film Barring the final takedown, of course. I think the biggest offender is when she's trying to flee the house and won't make the easy jump over Tina's body or duck under Jimmy's to escape from Jason and chooses to go out the window instead, but then run back into the house later and jump over Tina without a second thought, effectively trapping her once more in a closed space with the killer. Still, I was totally willing to overlook this because when she was cornered, she fought. She held onto that machete and kept swinging when previous movie survivors would have dropped in and run smashed a TV over Jason's head to protect her little brother, and kept fighting hard when he had her pins before Tommy races down the stairs in the last scene. All in all, I'd say she's the best Friday the 13th survivor of the first four films. Last but not least, I thought the way they developed Tommy's character for potential sequels was quite interesting, when upon release it was established that this was absolutely, no doubt, the conclusion to Friday the 13th. It would have been a cool divergence to have two survivors for the first time in the series alone, but the fact that they leave you guessing as to whether Jason Voorhees' legacy will continue on in Tommy was a neat little twist to add, at least to me. 
All in all, I really enjoyed this film, and I dare say that it's my favorite out of the first four movies. And looking at a lot of reviews from both the 80s and the last 10 years shows that I'm not the only one. Though critics at the time weren't all that fond of the film, mirroring the 24% critic rating on Rotten Tomatoes, the final chapter has become a cult classic in the horror fandom, and doing so well in theaters that Friday the 13th, A New Beginning, the fifth installment in the series, was released just 11 months later. With a budget of $1.8 million, the final chapter generated an overall revenue of $32.6 million at the box office, a giant feat for the horror community. Despite this staggering accomplishment, it did lose out as the highest grossing film in office in April to Police Academy, March's highest grossing film. Friday the 13th, the final chapter, only generated $24,802,371 its first month in office, roughly grossing just over two-thirds of Police Academy's April earnings at $37,415,165. Considering Jason's alleged final film released on an actual Friday the 13th in April 1984, I'd say some bad luck was almost destined to happen. But what do you guys think? Would you have ventured out on such an unlucky day to go see this movie opening night, or would you have waited until the weekend to watch it? Where do you think Gordon ran off to? What was your favorite kill? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next week in 1994. Some pack of tootsies, huh?